appreciate it and welcome everybody. We'll have people coming in over the next few minutes so the, the group will grow, but thank you um, early arrivers for joining us today for our final conversation with the Dean of the fall semester. My name is Brett Sion. I am the Director of Admissions and Financial Aid. And you'll see some other faces here on the screen that you may recognize or may have heard from at various times earlier in the fall, a couple of my admission and financial aid, aid colleagues, um, Associate Director Ross Yelsey, Associate Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid, Taryn Almanzar. Um, and what we wanna do today is um, provide some information for you. Um, many of you are in the application process because we are two weeks away today from our application deadline for our Master of Science programs. So many of you are in the process of finalizing, deciding, thinking about starting, all of that is absolutely fine. So we wanna provide some information for you today from our Dean, Jelani Cobb, and our Dean of Student Affairs, John Haskins. Um, we'll be talking with them about why Columbia? What makes us special? Why we are who we are? Why we are what we think the best of what we do? So I'm gonna be speaking with them and hopefully at the end, we'll be able to answer some of your questions. We'll open up the chat a little bit later. And I know we have some questions that you submitted via your registration form. So time permitting, we'll get to as many of those as we absolutely can. But I do wanna introduce our Dean Jelani Cobb and Dean of Student Affairs, John Haskins. And with that, I think we are just ready to, to jump right into it. So without any further ado, um, Dean Cobb, you have the honor of getting the first question. <laughs> um, it's a surprise. Yeah, surprise, surprise, <laughs> right? We've never had that. But um, I, I guess first, the Columbia Journalism School has been around for 111 years and counting, mm -hmm. founded by mm -hmm. Joseph Pulitzer. We are the, the school that awards the Pulitzer Prizes. So for, for the audience who's gathered here today and at various stages of the application process, you know, what would you say as the, the things that really make us who we are and why we are the Columbia Journalism School with a century plus of history? What makes us the place to come to for journalism education? Well... One, uh, I want to say thank you to everyone who took time out of their day uh, to join us today. Um, is it Ergen Hava? Uh, very smooth in the tuxedo, sir. <laughs> and um, we're happy to have all of you here with us. Uh, and also uh, thankful to our team at Admissions for everything they did to make this possible today. Uh, you know, if you ask me, uh, what makes us who we are. I'm going to to tell you uh, every time that it's community. And, you know, we have a 111, almost, you know, 112 year history that we fall back on. And, you know, history is really important because uh, we have a track record. You know, we have simply been doing one thing for more than a century, which is consistently producing the best journalists in the world. The way we're able to do that is the community that we've built. Uh, you know, I tell people, uh, you know, upfront, so they understand exactly, you know, what they're getting into, that we are an intense program. You work hard when you come here. But I also make a promise, uh, and we have not broken this promise, that you will, as hard as you work, you will never work harder than the person in the front of the room. And the reason I can say that is that our faculty are the part of this community that take really seriously their responsibility of training the next generation of journalists. When you walk into the building, if you have not yet had a chance to visit uh, Pulitzer Hall, uh, if you walk into the building, you'll see a plaque uh, that's on the side that tells you exactly what we are here to do. Uh, it says to educate the next generation of journalists to uphold the standards of excellence in journalism. That's what we do every day. Every day that I walk in, I look at that plaque and say, that's my mission for today. And, you know, when we 
look at um, our alumni, we have a distinguished pool of alumni, 15,000 strong, that are placed literally around the world in important positions in journalism uh, in every single significant news outlet that you can name. And that alumni group is part of our community uh, that we think of as uh, almost like the Columbia Extended Warranty Program. Because you graduate from here, um, you know, most people in one year, uh, and uh, you go out and join this community. And, you know, what happens is that you are now uh, within this body of people uh, who you can get in contact with, uh, who you will meet at alumni weekends, uh, who you will connect with uh, when you need something professionally. Uh, you know, I need to get in touch with someone. Oh, this person is also a fellow Columbia alum. Uh, I can reach out and mention that and uh, they'll look out to see what they can do uh, to help me in this situation. That is a crucial part uh, of you know this Columbia community, and additionally, you know we have a staff you know that every day wake up and come in uh, to think about how we can work collaboratively to make this the best institution that we can be. Um, many indicators you know refer to us as the number one journalism school in the world. I can tell you we spend about this much time thinking about that. Because our question is, how can we be a better journalism school? Um, and that's what we do. You know, it's not uh, complicated, and it really is complicated, but the thing that we set out to do, uh, our objectives are not uh, to maintain uh, the track record, the distinguished history that we have inherited, uh, to educate the next generation of journalists, uh, to uphold the standards of excellence in journalism. Thank you. Dean Haskins, as an individual who works with prospective students and students, alumni throughout their, the entire life cycle of a Columbia Journalism School student, um, who we see on this call today is very reflective of, the, of that population. We draw students all over the world, dozens of countries, dozens of states across the, the U.S., and that's reflective of who we have on this call today, but also we draw students with no journalism experience at all, in, up to individuals with a decade or more of experience. Why would you say Columbia is the place for, for these individuals from various backgrounds, levels of expertise, journalism experience, et cetera? There's so many aspects to that question, but look around. I want everyone on this call to look around, look up, down, Brady Bunch style here. Oh, I'm dating myself to see the other I remember students, <laughs> yeah, the other prospective students who are on this call. I generally like to wait until graduation to say this, but I'll say it today. One of the best assets, greatest assets here at Columbia Journalism School is your are your fellow students. Um, it's what you learn. And so when we talk about years of experience, say you have none, maybe you've done a couple of pieces for your college newspaper. And you're like, well, this is it. I want I want to go ahead and I want to pursue this. We give you all the skills to get going quickly. Uh, to jump right into the profession. Um, for some who've had a couple of, of years of experience but really want to up their game, this is the place to go. The level of expertise among our faculty is really second to none. People who had a few more years of experience who want to change direction, maybe going into our MA program, it's a perfect route for them. So we have different programs, different expertise, different students, diversity of students, diversity of experience within the faculty, the staff, uh, and your fellow students, so that everyone can find their place here at Columbia, uh, regardless of how much experience they have. It works out really well. Uh, we have a great track record of uh, getting everyone through the program here uh, because uh, we really cater to the diversity of our class, the diversity of experiences, diversity of geography. Um, they all find a place here, and you will too. But this this question would be for for both of you, I guess, somewhat quickly. And you you touched on it, but you know, both of you have had distinguished careers as journalists, and we are more than fortunate to have you both here at at Columbia. But as you look at the the skills that students get as they go through the program, um, 
how would you describe those? What, you know, students that are maybe within the next two weeks applying to be part of that next generation of, of journalists as we train them, what mm -hmm. skills could they anticipate coming out with for many of them less than a year? Mm -hmm. So how about this, Dean Haskins? I'll start and um, you finish. Okay. Uh, so what we do here is we work really hard to make sure that we uh, calibrate our curriculum and our offerings uh, to the skill sets that are most in demand uh, by employers now. Now, some of those skill sets don't change. Some of those skill sets are described uh, by Joseph Pulitzer in the essay he wrote in 1904, explaining why uh, we needed to create a journalism school at Columbia University. And if you visit our website, you see it summed up very succinctly uh, in that motto, reporting begins here. Uh, reporting is everything to what we do. So the skills that go into reporting, you know, information gathering, uh, interviewing, uh, how do you uh, find and verify uh, information, uh, all the, uh, the you know, particulars of uh, Freedom of Information Act and government document requests, all the various ways that you can go about uh, getting information that goes into uh, your reportage. We begin with an investigative um, uh, element uh, segment uh, so that everyone who walks out the door uh, at the end of the year has that foundation in investigative skills. Irrespective of whatever else you do in your career, you have that um, as your foundation. And then uh, beyond that, there are all sorts of uh, specific platform or, or uh, uh, medium oriented uh, skills that you develop, whether that is in audio uh, or if that is in visual, uh, or if you're interested in data uh, or if you're interested in computational, uh, we really have a, a wide array of ways that you can go and further hone and develop uh, your abilities to report. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we make sure that every single uh, person who comes through our program is steeped in a, a thorough training on the ethics of journalism. You know, that's fundamental to who we are. And quite frankly, uh, that's one of the things that our program is best known for. Uh, we produce journalists who take their ethical responsibilities very seriously. Uh, and then uh, in addition, you're, you're going to have uh, an intensive you know, writing experience as well uh, to make sure that you know, all of your kind of news gathering as well as your information presentation skills are, are up to par. And so Dean Haskins, I know uh, you may <laughs> want to pick up from here. Sure, absolutely. And there's the skills that you learn in the classroom and the other, the other exposure that you have to a number of our speakers um, and special guests and career services, you're going to be picking up a lot of uh, different skills uh, and resources in different ways, not just the, the news, um, not just the classroom. So yes, uh, writing and reporting, that's core to what we do here. And we do that because we really want transferable skills. Writing and reporting will never fail you. If you stay in journalism, if you leave journalism, if you change platforms, it will never fail you. So, and it, you know, that's a, that is our core, but of course there are audio skills, uh, in both in terms of boot camp and classes and other times, uh, you know, other places, um, we can get exposure to that, uh, opportunities for photography. Even if you don't take a class two weeks ago, we had a special photography workshop, uh, led by our, uh, assistant Dean in academic affairs, uh, just to expose students to that. Uh, in addition to the, the students that take the classes, there's obviously video work that you can do. Uh, but at the core of it is our writing and reporting, um, because that will never uh, leave you, and you can you can transfer that into pretty much any platform going forward. So there are many opportunities, not just in the classroom, but the other exposure that you get here at the journalism school throughout the year. Can I add um, one thing, which is that you know there used to be uh, these old commercials. I'm really dating myself now. This guy had a, a company called Hair Club for America. Uh, and at the end, uh, he would kind of say, uh, I'm not just the president, I'm also a customer. <laughs> so uh, I can say that I'm not the, just the dean, I'm also a student uh, for everything that uh, Dean Haskins said. 
uh, when I first came here, I had a, as a faculty member, I had a, a very long career as a print journalist. Uh, in my time as a faculty member, I've learned documentary and photography uh, from my colleagues uh, on the faculty. Uh, and so I've now done five documentaries, I think, four or five. Uh, and uh, I just had my uh, first photo published. Uh, and so I've been learning, you know, uh, just taking advantage of the kind of wide array of skill sets uh, that are available in this building uh, the same way that, uh, you know, that our students do. Well, Dean Cobb, don't take that professor hat off yet, because mm -hmm. um, I really want to hone in on a few things that really make us such a special place. And we've kind of gone over some general curriculum classes, skill set, but I, I, we really want to hone in on some things that we can say set us apart. Mm -hmm. And starting, I think, with the faculty. Um, so if you put keep that faculty hat on, um, you know, many students come to journalism school for the mentorship mm -hmm. and the professional relationships they can start to build with their faculty members. Mm -hmm. um, we have Pulitzer Prize winning faculty, mm -hmm. as well as winners of awards across platforms that they mm -hmm. specialize in. And it's an incredible group. And I would encourage all of the everybody in the audience to go to our website and read up on them if you're not familiar, because impressive isn't the word. So mm -hmm. could you talk a little bit about the the faculty relationship and the mentorship that our students get from them? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, how about this? I'll tell you um, about the conversations I've had this week, about two of them. Uh, maybe 30 minutes uh, before uh, we got on this call, I had a former student um, who was in my office and I was talking to him about how to uh, negotiate a, a raise uh, at his current uh, place of employment. Uh, and then uh, earlier this week, uh, I was talking with another uh, former student uh, who's just starting a position uh, in Washington, DC. And uh, I sent him a email with I don't know, six or seven uh, journalists who are you know working in Washington, D.C., who would be good for him uh, to know. Uh, and so the care and attention that you get in the classroom, one of the other things that's really significant here is that we have historically uh, maintained this tradition of small class sizes. So you do get uh, kind of one-on-one, -on -one, hands-on attention. That doesn't stop when you walk across the stage in May or August. You know, these are mentorship relationships that go on and continue for years. Uh, and then to give you on the other extreme of it, uh, at the beginning of my week, I had uh, lunch with a faculty member who graduated in the class of 1977. Uh, and one of his uh, peers from the class of 1977 and their professor, who is 97 years old, uh, and whom they have been in touch with for all of these years. Now, I can't promise you that every faculty member will be 97 years old and still taking your calls, uh, but I can tell you that it's not unusual for us to have these relationships that extend that amount of time uh, and for us to really be there. And, and the last thing that I'll say also that we have to just also uh, kind of give the brass tacks of it. It's not easy to get that kind of mentorship, you know, in the world that we occupy now. And so this has become even more valuable uh, to have people who are there who can, uh, even if it's just, you know, replying to a text message uh, or connecting you with a source that they know, and that winds up being a really important uh, element uh, of your career. Yeah, that all goes back to that sense of community that you mentioned, right? It's it's a close-knit group uh, that everybody is striving to be the best, whether it's the faculty, the students, our alumni, because we're at the forefront. We're, we're the leaders of that. Um, so that, that relationship is hugely important in, in the fabric of, of our school. Another thing that's hugely important in the fabric of our school are, are the prizes. We mentioned Pulitzer Prizes. That's the big name. Um, but that's certainly not all. The journalism school administers a number of awards across the journalism community and recognizes the best in the business at what they're doing. 
Um, Dean Haskins, could you talk about why that's so important for, for students to consider that as something that they would be not necessarily so much involved with right off the start, but having that as part of the Columbia community is another big thing that that is could be a benefit to to students. Absolutely, it's very inspirational, uh, uh, and you know it's funny. One of my first weeks here, one of the prospective students came in an orientation said, "Do you hand out any Pulitzers to current students?" And I said, "Just wait, just wait." Well, let's talk about the experiences, what you will get. It is very inspiring to be in a place. I'm now on the seventh floor of Pulitzer Hall, and to see the awards that have been given over the years, it really is quite something. Uh, when the Pulitzers are here, the judges love to interact with our students. And every year when the judges come and look at the, you know, the entries for the Pulitzer Awards, we break um, we break them uh, down into different classrooms and they, they visit with our students and answer their questions, not really about the prizes, but the experience and uh, going forward. Uh, a number of big ceremonies we have, the Cabot and, um, especially, uh, we do have student involvement in that. And I think we, uh, even the DuPont, there will be opportunities to volunteer for that for select students going forward. But really when you step back of it, you think about the quality of the journalists who enter this building and your chances to interact with them. Recently, we had the winner of the Chancellor Award, a local journalist um, who had flown from New York, who was honestly, it was, it was a very inspiring story of his years, decades of service serving his community. Um, and he asked to meet with students when he was here. That is not uncommon. I would say that is common that um, these award winners are in our building, um, reaching out to students um, and interacting with them. They love to be here. They love the experience of being here. Um, there are also opportunities within our prizes department. We have two students every semester who work with the prizes department um, and win that position through an application process, which is a very, um, that's really uh, quite interactive and really close up involved with all of our awards that happen throughout, this, um, throughout the season. But it is an inspiring place to be. The level of quality of the, the journalists to come in here is just jaw dropping. It's um, mm -hmm. it's really quite something. Can, can I add something to um, you? Know, one of the things that I came to love about this place, you know, very early in my relationship with uh, the journalism school uh, was the dynamism, you know, that Dean Haskins uh, mentions. You don't know who you will run into in the hallway. Uh, because all sorts of people, you know, from the world of journalism come through, or people from the world of politics, you know, you could come in and, you know, the mayor is in a lot, well, not our mayor, because he has other things no. in mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> he, has, he has other issues. Uh, but but some mayor <laughs> could very well be in uh, the lobby. Uh, or uh, just a few weeks ago, I was at an event with uh, the governor of Maryland, and I said, I would love to have you come in and, and uh, have our uh, MA politics students uh, talk with you. Uh, and so he was like, sure, you know, let's set something up. And so the name and reputation, reputation of this institution is such that, you know, it really, uh, it wouldn't be a surprise for you to see any particular uh, significant newsmaker, uh, you know, walking you know, into someone's classroom at any given point in time. Uh, and, you know, as Dean Haskins said, when people show up to to pick up their awards, they generally make a stop in a classroom uh, beforehand. So there's that as well. And then just one last thing. We have so many speakers. I mean, really, there's almost too much to attend. Just earlier this week, Ira Glass was here mm -hmm. um, and he stayed after the presentation and would not leave. All right. That's a little harsh. But he, mm -hmm. he insisted on speaking to pretty much any student who had a, had a question. Mm -hmm. You know, you just don't get that at a lot of other places. And there are so many people coming in and out of the doors of Pulitzer Hall. It's it's quite something. I don't know if I, I won't do it now, but I don't know if I've ever shared the story of how I almost literally ran into a mall Clooney coming out of the elevator one time. I was waiting, push the button, the doors opened and I start to walk in and she starts to walk out. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll share that one with, in another forum, but For those that, who that was my know. brush with fame in, in our lobby. Yeah, she's on campus, as is Hillary Clinton, but not in our building today. But it wouldn't be unusual. <laughs> Never know. Um, you know, one of the greatest things about the journalism school is how focused we are on being innovative and focusing on what students need to 
know and skill sets they need to develop in order to be those next mm -hmm. leaders within the field. So um, Dean Cobb, some of the things that, you know, the, the school is very interested in being at the forefront and reporting on and things like local news, artificial sure. intelligence, climate change. Um, so, yeah, I mean, all of those things, you know, so if we, if we start with local news, um, you know, that goes from, you know, the, the kind of technical uh, all the way up to uh, the tactical. Uh, and so on the technical side of things, uh, we have, you know, first we have just hired our local news professor, um, you know, who uh, is amazing, uh, Professor Juan Manuel Benitez. And, uh, you know, we made an investment in uh, these kits that will allow people to shoot and edit and, uh, you know, file stories all with their cell phone you know, and, you know, a gimbal so that you have steady uh, camera angles and also a microphone attached to it. And, you know, we looked at these things and, um, and quite frankly, I didn't quite understand them. And Juan Manuel was like, oh, it'll work, it'll work. <laughs> uh, and so people are now roving the streets of New York City, uh, you know, creating, uh, you know, these news stories uh, in a way that, you know, would never have been possible, uh, even, you know, five years ago. Uh, and so we have lots of kind of interventions like that. Uh, on the more tactical side of it, you know, we have positioned ourselves. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do, you know, with our student loan uh, repayment, a uh, loan repayment assistance program, uh, was to provide entree for people uh, into local uh, and nonprofit news. Uh, and so we said, how can we do that? And we uh, put our heads together and created this uh, program. Uh, such that, you know, over the course of five years, you can have up to $50,000 in student loan debt repaid. Uh, and is, if you're working in local nonprofit news. Uh, and so both how we approach it, you know, technically, and the way in which we uh, facilitate it, you know, tactically are important. On AI, uh, you know, we had, you know, amazingly, other parts of Columbia University coming to us you know, at that kind of watershed moment uh, when ChatGPT, the first iteration, went live, uh, and everyone was trying to figure out what this meant, you know, as uh, as broadly knowledgeable and uh, incredibly you know, uh, well resourced as this institution is, lots of people came to us, the journalism school, to say, "How can we understand this? And what should we be thinking about with this?" And it just so happened. Uh, we didn't have one faculty member or two faculty members. Uh, we had four faculty members, three of whom lead institutes here, uh, who have been doing work around artificial intelligence and large language models, uh, what they can do, what they can't do, and the ways in which they may uh, impact or disrupt the way news uh, is produced. Uh, and so, you know, we really have a great deal, and I won't go through the entire kind of climate change uh, part of it, but uh, I will tell you that we are currently, one of the things that we're doing, um, you know, actively in the background now is creating a structure uh, such that we can guarantee that each student who graduates from Columbia Journalism School in the future will do so prepared to cover climate as it relates to their particular area of interest. And so um, if you are a sports uh, reporter, we're not telling you that you have to become a climate reporter, but we want you to understand how climate will impact sports in the future. Uh, and so on for people who are covering politics, for people who are covering immigration, uh, for people who are covering housing, all of those kinds of things will have uh, a relationship to the environment that will change. And we want you to be prepared to be able to cover that efficiently. And you mentioned the loan repayment program, um, you know, showcasing and kind of foreshadowing a little bit about how we continue to work with our students once they leave. Mm -hmm. um, and as you mentioned, you're, once you're a Columbia J School alum, you, you, are, you are for life. And, and Dean Haskins, you oversee our Office of Career Development, um, coincidentally. And, um, you know, there are a number of exclusive internships, fellowships 
job opportunities that are only for Columbia Journalism School students. No other journalism students, no other students at Columbia. This, this is just for our graduates. And we also host the largest journalism job expo that there is anywhere. So could you talk a little bit about those opportunities that are unique just for our graduates? Sure, absolutely. And I want to stay on that issue of local news and how we want to support and re help rebuild local news. One of the exclusive programs that we uh, started a couple of years ago was something called I with INN, the in, um, Institute for Nonprofit News, where basically the J School helps fund internships at 21, 23, 24, different places around the country, very diverse places in Washington, D.C., in Honolulu, in Mississippi, Wisconsin, all over the country. So again, we are you know, putting our money where our mouth is there and really helping to fund these internships after graduation for a number of our, uh, um, number of our employees, a number of our graduates. Uh, that's a very robust uh, program that we've had for a couple of years, and we've had great success with that. We have a number of, as I said, exclusive inter um, internship pro um, opportunities for our students that are only open to Columbia J School graduates, and they vary pretty tremendously, all, you know, from Reuters to grief i can't even think of all the names but there are dozens that are available just to our students i want to talk for a minute bit about not just our career expo which is enormous but just our career as office in general before i started here i've been here about three years i used to recruit at columbia and i knew even then before i started here that our careers office our depth of knowledge is second to none across the world. Our connections are astounding that we have. We know everybody, pretty much everyone comes here. Just to give you an idea for last year's career fair, we had about 220 students who'd signed up for this. We had 400 recruiters from 150 companies. That's right, we had more recruiters than we had students. No, that doesn't mean you'll be offered a job that day, but it does mean that you'll be exposed to any number of uh, companies that you didn't even know existed and didn't even know were hiring from across the globe. In addition to that, we have meetings where we have employers come to campus throughout the year, 60, 70 different visits. And these are not companies you haven't heard of. These are companies you've all heard of. The New York Times, Reuters, Bloomberg, ProPublica, um, and some smaller companies too. They're always here. GQ Magazine was here uh, relatively recently. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that was a very popular with a lot of our students. We have um, uh, companies that own uh, TV stations across the globe. There are so many opportunities here. Uh, it's my dream for all of our students to be, and when May rolls around or August rolls around, that they have choices, not just that they landed something, but they will have several more. We also have opportunities within Pulitzer Hall for fellowships for people who, who stay at uh, Columbia Journalism Review or investigative, our investigative program. Um, some students, I think, oh, haven't you graduated? Oh, I'm still working here. We have a number of those, and those are very coveted jobs uh, that we have here at Columbia, uh, where students stick around and do incredible work uh, after graduation. Um, it's really uh, quite mind-boggling, the different opportunities that you'll be exposed to and the different uh, employers and um, fellowship opportunities that you'll be presented with here at Columbia. I could go on. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I won't. I... Dean Cobb, I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier. You you started to get into the, the centers and institutes mm -hmm. that we have here. Again, unique to Columbia Journalism School. These are housed within the within Pulitzer Hall here. So could you take a moment just to talk about those? They cover various topics from digital media innovation to civil and human rights. Why are those such an important thread in the fabric of what the J School means? Mm -hmm. uh, our centers are integral to our intellectual mission. Um, and you know they serve an interesting purpose, which is that uh, they interface uh, with the students and with the building in uh, particular ways, but they also uh, are in some ways outwardly facing. Uh, they do research. Uh, they sponsor journalism, they do investigations, uh, and they're organized around different uh, areas of focus. Uh, before I became dean, I was the director of the Lipman Center, uh, which focuses on journalism and civil and human rights. Uh, my colleague, uh, Emily Bell, uh, is the director of the Tau Center, which focuses on digital journalism and is at the forefront of, uh, of understanding and researching AI. 
uh, as well as uh, you know misinformation and disinformation, uh, the entire way that the kind of digital landscape has changed, uh, you know how journalism is done. Uh, we, we have uh, the Brown Center, uh, which is you know best known for its work on media innovation. Uh, the Dart Center, which is a real gem, uh, it has become increasingly important because they deal with journalism and trauma. And so when you see, unfortunately, mass shootings, uh, or you see uh, warfare, uh, like is you know happening between uh, Israel and Hamas now, uh, or you know Russia and Ukraine, uh, there is trauma that is uh, imposed upon the people who experience it, but also for the journalists who cover it very often. And the Dart Center has almost single-handedly changed the conversation around that and the way that uh, news organizations now handle who you send to cover, how long the person stays there, has changed the way that we approach, you know, even the kind of what would once have been uh, a completely unbelievable proposition to say, I don't think you should interview that person right now. I know they're right in front of you and perhaps that, you know, you, you might not see them again, but this is this is not the time to put the microphone in that person's face. Uh, and that's actually a conversation that we're having uh, as a result of the work that um, that's happening in the DART Center. Uh, and so we have, you know, did I leave, no, we have the Lee Center, uh, uh, which focuses on global journalism. Uh, and uh, we now have uh, the Newmark Center, which is our newest center, uh, which focuses on ethics uh, and security. Uh, and you know, we have a, a, the great uh, journalist, Margaret Sullivan, who just joined us uh, to become director of Newmark. Uh, and so uh, I, I have to try to make sure I give everyone equal time because it's like talking about your children. <laughs> you don't want to <laughs> leave one out. And so, um, but you know, the centers are really, really foundational uh, and they're part of the way that we, so we're not kind of passive recipients of journalism or kind of off in a secluded corner uh, teaching journalism. You know, we're actually practicing journalism, which is another thing to say about the faculty. Our faculty produce, uh, you know, I just turned in a profile for The New Yorker a week ago. Um, and so, and, you know, I'm doing the same thing that all of you will be doing, which is kind of slogging through edits and, and fact checking things and all that. Uh, and so we produce, we're active uh, on the faculty side and on the side of our centers. I, I don't know how you're finding time to actually practice as well, but uh, you know, I have four year old twins. So, you know, I get them to write the first draft and then I just come in and clean it up. There you go. Yeah. Train them now. Right. And. They're they're part of the business. You have to work on the crayon part. You know they don't accept drafts and crayon, but you know <laughs> we can clean that up. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um. So before we, I just want to leave a couple more minutes. I think we've got about five more minutes, but um, and we'll try to take a couple questions um and and leave just a few minutes for that. But my final question for Deans Haskins and and Cobb, again. I want to make sure that we emphasize this alumni network that we have, the 15,000 plus strong all over the world. And I, you know, we hear that, and what I tell prospective students is all of those things that you mentioned, Dean Haskins, about the Meet the Medias, the career expos, and all of those things, oftentimes that will help you get that first foot in the door. But as we know for journalists, oftentimes there's a second job, a third job, a fourth job. You're not always staying in that same news organization your entire career. And leveraging that network is oftentimes how that happens. So, you know, just maybe for one minute, if each of you could just speak to the power of that alumni network, because we've talked about, you know, what it's like when they're here and what they are exposed to. But once you leave, as we've said, you're always a Columbia J School alum and leveraging that that network is hugely important in, in people's careers. So if each mm -hmm. of you could just take a minute just to talk about that for a minute. Well, Dean Haskins, I went first sure. last time, so you can sure. go. I'll, I'll jump in. In the last 24 hours, I have had interactions with three different alumni. One who graduated in May, he wanted to, me to look over his cover letter. Another one who basically wanted to become more involved in the school and a third one who wants to do some research using the Columbia Journalism School. What's interesting about all of them is 
they always tell me what a great time they have here. Now, now while they're here, they may not tell me that, but once they're gone, they, they do that. It's the devotion to this school uh, that is really quite surprising and how people come back and talk about how useful it was to them, both in terms of what they learned in the classroom, the connections they made, and of course, I'll say it again, the other students who they went, uh, went through with. Um, when I talked about the career fair and all those people coming back, all those recruiters, you'd be amazed at how many of those are former students who go out in the world, get jobs, and then want to come back and help recruit Columbia students because they know Columbia students are so great. So there's so many interactions where these alumni come into, into contact with current students uh, throughout their careers. And they really, they're, very, they're eager to come back here. They're eager to help, or to reach back and pull somebody else along. Um, it's every time, again, three in the last 24 hours, uh, and I'm the Dean of Current Students, not the Dean of Alumni Students. So that'll give you an idea of how interwoven our alumni network is with the work that we do every day. Dean Cobb? Yeah, you know, I, I'll tell you a story. Um, and this happened the year before last. Um, as sometimes happens, uh, we had a, uh, a student who was, actually he was an alum um, at this point, uh, he had, but he had just graduated, you know, a couple of months earlier and he had a job lined up and then the job fell through, you know, misfortune, terrible thing. Um, and so uh, he was kind of trying to figure out what he was going to do next. And, you know, he was my student and he was a student of uh, one of my colleagues. And, you know, the colleague mentioned, he was like, oh, have you heard about this, you know, that, that happened? And I said, yeah, yeah, he told me. And he was like, oh, well, let's, let's make some phone calls. Um, and the first, you know, phone calls you make are people who are in your alumni network who, hey, uh, we have uh, this, you know, recent graduate, you know, really outstanding, was in my class, he did this and this and uh, did a report on that. And, um, and, you know, if you have anything, he's someone you should think about. Uh, and it took a few weeks, but, you know, we actually wound up introducing him uh, to a position that he wound up getting. Uh, and so the first thing that we think, uh, you know, we have those kinds of relationships, um, you know, or those kinds of asks, whether it's something big, you know, like lining some up, someone up with an employment uh, opportunity or something just, um, you know, kind of straightforward. Uh, can you Zoom with our class and talk about this story that you just published? Uh, you know, all of those things, you know, the first and I started to say Rolodex, then I would have... Uh, contact <laughs> list, contact myself. list, we say. I will say your contact uh, list. Uh, you know, the first people that you reach out to are going to be the alumni. And I've, I've never heard that having Columbia Journalism School on a resume has been a bad thing. So it's that... that not in, not in 112 years. a lot of importance, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see. Uh, thank you, uh, Ross. Um, for putting in the chat. Um, we are almost at the 45 minute mark. So we're going to have to to say goodbye in a few minutes. But Ross, did, did we get a, one or two questions that we could pose quickly here to, to finish up? We did. Thanks, Brett. Um, so as Brett mentioned, the deadline for our MS program, MS in data journalism and PhD is coming up on December 15th. So pretty soon for people who are kind of in gear of kind of finishing up their application, what uh, do our deans say about what makes a strong application, no matter whether you're new to journalism or you've been working in the field for a while? What makes a strong application? You know, I, I try not to be, uh, I remember when I was first here, some, of these, some students said to me, what are some of the key words I can use? No, no, that's not it. What I think stands out is your individuality and the passion that you bring to wanting to pursue journalism and basically help others help audiences viewers readers going forward that's what you know when i'm reading uh applications uh all of our you know all of our applications are read by faculty members and you know, we take a look at them too in the admissions department we like to you know see students who have a passion for journalism who want to be a part of the profession who want to help who want to tell stories who want to help people who want to inform other than that i don't want to describe what how you do that i want to see your drive in there, your personality, your inspiration going forward. Of course, there are some particulars. I hope that you know the difference between a newspaper and a radio, but I, I trust that you do. And we want to know that you sort of understand, you know, what, what the profession is, but it's that drive, that passion, that um, 
inspiring uh, message that you send to us about what you want to do, how you want to inform the populace, and how you want to build skills that you can turn around and use in the service of others. Great. Thank you. And then for um, people um, joining this conversation, a lot of them are um, international from different countries all over. And of course, our student body is very international. How does the school build a community with people from all these different backgrounds, whether it's from different parts of the U.S. or different parts of the globe? Would you like to go? This is oh, kind of sure. No, absolutely. You know, we, and then I'll, I'll follow up with you. No, absolutely. So how do we build a community? Well, generally through work, if you must know. Mm -hmm. We find our strongest bonds generally come in our initial reporting class where students are forced and later delighted to work together <laughs> and really help each other. Uh, in addition to that, the, the schoolwork, which is really what binds, it's really our primary you know, coursework is our, our primary um, effort for all of our students. We have a number of student affiliated, you know, student affiliation groups uh, throughout um, throughout the journalism school, and they vary pretty tremendously. We have groups that are affiliated with some of the leading minority journalist organizations throughout the country, like the National Association of Black Journalists, uh, the Native American, um, I'm sorry, the Indigenous Journalism uh, uh, association. Uh, also, we have a women in media group. We have our student government, which is aligned with the Society of Professional, Professional Journalists, SPJ. Every year, we give uh, students the opportunity to build their own groups, be it around climate. This year, we have one for um, Chinese-speaking students, which you've never had before. We give students the opportunity to come up with their own groups, so even if we haven't had them before. So we really listen to students and we let them gather as they want to gather and have different experiences. And by the way, all of these groups are not closed to people who might fit that definition. Absolutely not. One of the reasons we have these groups is to expose students to other people's uh, experiences, uh, other people's you know desires to pursue journalism. So starting with the classwork and the bo the bonding uh, that goes on there, especially in the reporting class, but also a lot of uh, opportunities outside outside the classroom for students to get together, uh, help each other, learn from each other, and grow in that way. Yeah, and I, I would uh, reiterate everything that Dean Haskins has said. You know, if you uh, kind of walk the hallways of uh, Pulitzer Hall, it, it looks like the United Nations here. Uh, you know, we have students from all over the world, students from typically in the vicinity of 40 states um, in the United States, a whole array of different backgrounds, um, but the kind of common bond of reporting. Uh, and so, you know, there are people who uh, you will be paired up to report with, uh, and you will have a different background than that person, that person will have a different experience than you have. Um, and the thing that you have in common is that you have to file. <laughs> and <laughs> Uh, you know, people really kind of build these relationships uh, that endure, uh, you know, uh, around that. And um, and then we also have relationships both in the building and again, back to our alumni network. Whoever you are, wherever you are from, it is likely that there has been a person from that place before who uh, graduated uh, from here. And so when we were uh, in Birmingham last summer, uh, for the National, Associ National Association of Black Journalists Convention, we had lots of people who were just graduates in Alabama, uh, who drove you know, people of all kinds of backgrounds, uh, who drove uh, to Birmingham uh, to to come see you know, the journalism school uh, or people, the representatives from the journalism school, uh, and so we really do pride ourselves on building these connections. And you know, I, I started and I will end with the same way, saying that this all comes down to you know our community. And that doesn't just happen in Alabama. It happens in India. Our head of careers was recently there That's visiting right. her mother, and she never stops working. So she had, was meeting up with alumni in three different cities across India. It happens all over the globe, really, where the alumni come out uh, to support the school. Great. And one last question. We have a lot more I see in the chat. Thanks for the great questions. If you want to join our drop-in sessions, which I put the link in for earlier, you can ask those, especially about courses, about other opportunities. We're happy to chat more in the coming weeks about that. But this is a question for Dean Cobb. Um, in addition to leading the school uh, as the dean, do you also continue to teach and what kind of things might people be able to learn from you as a teacher? Yeah, I, I absolutely do. Um, and so this is my second year as dean. Um, my first year as dean, I did not teach. You know, I taught as faculty six years before that, 
Um, and so I took one year uh, out of the classroom and I'm very eager uh, to get back into it. Um, and so this coming next semester, uh, I will be teaching opinion writing. And uh, I don't know what I'll teach next year, uh, but I often uh, teach ethics, uh, I teach reporting, uh, and I am in the midst of putting together a course. It's not completed yet, uh, but I am uh, finalizing the syllabus for a course called uh, American History for Reporting, um, which is you know what I'm really excited about, which is uh, meant to give people contextual information, you know, 50 to 70 years of contextual information about whatever beat you might be covering, you know, um, and as it relates to the United States. Uh, and then, you know, perhaps we'll have a corollary on kind of world history uh, for reporting. And so this goes well. Excellent. Um, I, I want to give a, a special thank you to um, Dean Haskins and Dean Cobb for participating in our final conversation with the deans for this semester. As I mentioned at the beginning, we are two weeks from today, two weeks away from our first application deadline for our Master of Science, our data degree, and a PhD program. Um, January, early January for the Master of Arts, January 15th for our dual degree with computer science. So I encourage everybody to go to our website and make sure you um, read the requirements, adhere to the deadlines because that's coming up. But over the next two weeks leading up to December 15th, we're going to have a dash to the deadline where every day we're gonna have at least one, sometimes two, um, open office hour drop-in sessions where you can meet with us, um, a representative from the admissions office, and get your last minute questions answered. If you haven't started an application, it is not too late. We certainly encourage you to do that. If you have, you're encouraged to complete it as soon as possible. Um, for those of you applying to our Master of Science program, you will know that there's a writing test that is involved with that. And that app or the, um, the scheduling for the writing test is open now. So as soon as you submit your application, you will get information about that writing test. So we encourage you to do that as soon as possible. But as you see Ross put in the chat, the link to sign up for our drop-ins over the next two weeks. So please do that. We wanna get all of your questions answered prior to the 15th and, and we'll be available to do that. Um, also, as we mentioned earlier, next week, we are gonna be having um, an alumni panel discussion. So if you wanna hear from a couple of our recent alums, with our um, Dean of Career Development, um, Anusha Srivastava. She will be hosting that and um, we'll be able to let, let you hear from some of our alums as well. So this is not the final conversation at all, but it's the final conversations with Dean Cobb and Dean Haskins. So again, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy, busy schedules to, to share your insights with everyone. Thank you all. And have a great weekend, everybody, and we look forward to talking with you soon. Take care.